So, Bob, I have a bunch of emails. Let's answer them. You and me, what do you say, Bob? I say, let's answer them. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Bob? I am your friend, Bob, from graduate school way back when, a therapist in practice here in Seattle as well. In case people don't know our backstory, they might be new to the podcast or they've forgotten. Bob and I went to graduate school together starting in 1995. Mm -hmm. We uh, met on our very first day of class. We did. And it was, a, uh, it was, you know, at our university and a lot of graduate school programs, they tend to do this. They'll have an introductory class that kind of acclimates you to graduate school and mm-hmm. the basics of theory and technique. And uh, that was the course we were taking. And there was only yeah. like six or seven students. And, and in true Antioch form, we were sitting in a circle, no desk, and uh, in a chair like um, like a kumbaya circle or something. <laughs> um, I will say that that always bothered me because I'm a note taker and I also, it's a little too vulnerable in a sense, especially it people is. I don't know that well. Yeah, right. And so uh, back then in the mid nineties, Antioch almost never had tables. I don't know if you remember, but it, there was almost never tables. Mm-hmm. The other thing is just no one had laptops back then. And so Mm-mm. you didn't mm-hmm. really need, a, and most people, anyway, point is, is that uh, uh, now every class, it's always tables. It's weird. It's like very different feel at Antioch anyway, um, because that's where I teach. But anyway, Bob and I met and uh, I looked up to him. He was a little bit older than me and he knew a lot more about therapy than I did. And... We took to each other pretty well. Yeah. Uh, we drank beer after class and uh, started playing cards together. Yeah. We would we would watch a uh, songs game. And the the real kicker for me was that Bob was friends with a lot of other poker players whom they played poker and cards like three times a, a week. <laughs> and the 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 most glorious thing I'll I'll never forget it. So as a kid, I grew up playing cards with my dad. And my dad would play cards with all the kids. You know, he played cards with his friends, but when he was uh, training all of us to play cards, he had certain rules. Like, uh, when it's your turn to bet, bet. Don't don't wait for someone to tell you, by the way, it's your turn to bet. You know, there's certain flow uh, protocols to follow to make sure the game flows well. And every time I played poker with my friends, I would sort of, you know, rope them into playing poker. I was always the the Nazi saying, hey, by the way, you know, <laughs> Odegaard, it's time for you to bet. <laughs> and, you know, Atkins, vet, bet. Or no, it's, you know, it's we're playing five card draw. It's not seven, like, come on. And when I played with you, you and your friends, everyone knew what to do. And if anyone was distracted and fell out of line, occasionally, like, they'd be distracted and they'd forget to bet. Everyone came down on that person like a ton of bricks. And I was, I, I just thought, oh my God, I found my people. Every one of these people is a poker Nazi. This is the best. And it, it, we had some epic games. Yeah. And we played for real money, which yeah. I'm guessing is probably illegal on some level. But like a bad. No. Oh, it isn't? No, it's legal. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. You're not allowed to be a casino, which makes money off a money game, but people getting together to play poker privately, totally legal. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the uh, uh, we a bad a bad night would be losing like three dollars oh, fifty yeah. cents. Yeah. Like it, to lose three dollars, it right. was like a disgrace. You had you had really tanked yes. it, and yes. and you felt bad about yourself. <laughs> it's just yeah. funny to think about that. But anyway, and then after graduate school and beyond, Bob and I remained friends and yeah. have been both friends, but also work colleagues. You know, yeah. we, we talk about work. And in the beginning of this podcast 12 years ago, I thought, well, of course, I, I can't do this podcast alone. I don't like doing things by myself. And I immediately thought, well, of course, Bob, Bob and I, you know, it's perfect. Bob and I talk about all sorts of things. We talk about psychology. And I asked you to be on the podcast and you're like, hell no. Uh, because I'm shy, essentially. Mm -hmm. You said you're shy. Yes. And I was like, oh, God, well, now what do I do? Well, I guess I'll go to my other best friend, Umberto. He's not a psychologist. He's just a random dude. And And not shy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> exactly. And so, uh, and then it took, I don't know, eight, nine years for me to eventually yeah. convince you to be on the podcast. Right. It's been, you lived in the other house before, and you've been in this house for how long? Um, the current house? Yeah. Uh, uh, two, and, two and a half years about. Right. So, and then I think you were in that other house maybe a year, year and a half. Yeah. So Two years, yeah. Two years. I, I mean, um, I came on the podcast when you're in the half in oh, the other okay. house, and and we did it at that place for a year, year and a half, or something like that. Okay. So, so we've been, been doing about this four together four years ago. Four years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right on. Yeah. It doesn't feel like that long. Yeah, yeah. There's so many weird things about 2020 that feel weird to me. Like mm. on one hand, uh, pre-pandemic just feels like decades ago. Yeah. Um. But in other ways, I feel like time is just screaming by, of course. Anyway. Yeah. Upper tier patron Kathleen asks, if you could teach the world one concept, what would it be? Bob, what would you say? Kindness. Ooh. Without a doubt. How would you kindness. teach it? I don't know. Lead by example, I guess. Um, be kind to people who are unkind, I suppose. I'd, I'd be interested in that because... Um, best thing you can do to a dog who feels cornered is get down low and be gentle, right? You're not going to whip a dog who feels cornered and uh, has fear aggression into any kind of kindness. And you might get compliance or obedience, but you are not going to get a good, warm relationship. And what kind of relationship do you want to have? This is, I'm thinking like a dog trainer because Colleen's a dog trainer. But but I think people are similar. That um, to meet unkindness with kindness is probably one of the greatest things a person could do and um, perhaps one of the least rewarding. Did you see that movie City Slickers? Oh, yeah. There's this, there's this fabulous scene towards the end of the film where Billy Crystal says, these two drunk guys are, you know, going to harass him or whatever. And he's like, they're just bullies. They're just going to bully me and they're just going to humiliate me. So I'll let them. And he walks up to him and he lets them humiliate him. Right. And I thought, oh, yeah, you're leading with an open hand. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's vulnerable to do that vulnerable to be humiliated and to know that that's what's coming but um it sort of beats aggression yeah in the long run i mean i'm not saying it's safe but yeah it's beautiful the uh uh way i would answer the question what one concept it would be uh attachment <laughs> mm. which isn't a simple concept to teach but uh, the most important part, and I find myself increasingly refining my ability to describe this over time. And, That's awesome. Uh, which I will tr attempt to do right now. Um, and I'm developing what I'm calling, and I'm guessing other people have come up with this or in different ways, but so it's not necessarily new, but I think it's I'm packaging it in my particular way, which is that when we uh, learn the trigger pain, fear, anger, hostility trigger cycle, which let me explain. Um, so uh, in a couple, you're um, in a relationship and your partner opposes you. Like it's just a common kind of annoyance in relationships where you're, you say something like, you know, I, f I find that people that f uh, like the color blue are kind of basic. And then your partner says like, well, I don't know. I mean, blue is a nice color. Okay. So in that little moment, your partner is, is opposing you. You know, just a conversation. But you rinse and repeat that kind of oppositional stance with your partner. And it, it gets hurtful. Okay. So it's a trigger. So it's a, a, a stimulus of, uh, one, you know, the fifth opposition that day. And you're hurt. So it's pain. You're, it, it hurts your feelings that the person is uh, not respecting your thoughts or just trying to get in your way or just not agreeing with you or something. And then you get angry because it's easier to be angry. And then we do hostile behavior of some kind. So it's either by getting quiet or yelling at them, why do you, why do you such an oppositional person? Or you punish them later by refusing to be nice in some way or something. And then you trigger the other person, and then the person is now hurt or afraid, and then they get angry, and then they get hostile, and then they trigger you. And this cycle just goes on and on. And I've talked about this a lot of times, but um, I, I'm, I'm trying to package it as the 
the trigger, pain, fear, anger, hostility, trigger cycle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and it can be extended into politics when oh. uh, progressive liberals like you and I uh, will talk or, um, I don't know, post things on Facebook that says – uh, Republicans are idiots, or anyone who votes for this person uh, is a Nazi. Uh, that's a trigger to uh, that person or that group, and they feel pain on one hand because it's it's hurtful to say, and they're afraid of of something like whatever they're afraid of of you know liberals ruining America or something, and then it's hard to express that hurt and that fear, so they get angry. And then they get hostile, and then they attack back, and then they trigger the liberals, and then the, you know it's, this cycle just goes on and on. And without anyone understanding the trigger, pain, fear, anger, hostility, trigger cycle, we uh, are in a, a a positive feedback loop where it just increases and increases and increases until you have people literally killing each other. And uh, without and so if everyone were aware of this in very real ways, one obviously we'd be able to improve our intimate relationships and our parenting for that matter because it because we can be we're also triggered by our kids and then we react out of pain fear we get angry we get hostile with our kids mm -hmm. and then we trigger our kids which you know causes a, a feedback loop there. Um, so our romantic relationships, our friend relationships, our work relationships, our parenting, but also on a broader level, our politics. Mm -hmm. And um, so that would be one concept that I would teach the world. Right if on. I, if I could. Um, Heather from Vermont has a few interesting questions for us. And by the way, if you send us uh, these kind of short questions, I, I find that they can stimulate some interesting uh, conversations. So don't be shy if you just want to shoot us like, a random question, which these I think are. Which three TV movie characters would you say best portray your personality, Bob? What do you think? Neo from The Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> How so? No, I'm kidding. I wish, right? I saw that movie with you, actually. I, I, I'm pretty sure. The first time? Oh, I, was, I saw that movie three times in the theater when it came out. Yeah, we, I'm I, sure I, one was with you. Yeah, yeah it was the, I think we saw it opening night oh, um, so fun. at Oak Tree. Oak Tree. Oh, awful theater. Yeah. Well, well I don't know. I mean, well, the, no, 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 no leg room. Oh, really? Have you been there lately? Well, yes. nobody's been there lately. Oh, no, no. no. That's that's a, that's one of the closest theaters to where yeah. I live. You know, deluxe. Yeah, you reserve your seats. Yep. It's a, a giant easy chair. Yep. The whole Recliner. thing. Yeah, lots Brilliant. of leg room. Almost yeah. too much leg room in some ways. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. I, re I remember. Snacks. I remember walking down the street with you and Beth and Mike and. And we were, it was dark and we were walking to someone's parked car that was like parked kind of far away. And I remember talking about it and feeling like I didn't know if I liked it or not. Mm. I, I remember that feeling like, mm -hmm. cause it was a different uh, move. Cause I'm not a huge Kung Fu movie person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Kung Fu uh, tone to the movie. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it was also kind of a confusing, it was, but it, it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe like a couple year, a couple weeks later, or like maybe upon second viewing that I was like, oh my God, this movie is genius. It is. <laughs> I mean, it still is, still holds yeah, up. This, it does. I just this, watched it. The maybe second two. two ago. What do you think of the sequels? I was a little disappointed, but I want to like them. Yeah. So I've I've watched them a number of times too. And oh really? Yeah, and I'm always like, eh, disappointing. Yeah. 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 And the third one I think was probably the least good. Yeah. Yeah. Though, did you hear they're they're gonna make another one? I did. Yeah. I hope they do. I mean, assuming they have a good story. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, I could see it going a variety of ways. I could uh -huh. see them going deeper into the silliness mm -hmm. and it becoming more confusing because mm -hmm. the Wachowski brothers. Uh, or do they call them brothers anymore? Because nope. do they say sisters now or do they? That's what I read last. Oh, sisters, Wachowski yeah. sisters. Okay. Yeah. So the Wachowski sisters, uh, as their career progressed, their movies didn't get less confusing. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And well, so I could see it going mm -hmm. more confusing because of that trend. Or I mm -hmm. could see them going, you know what? Let's get back to basics. Let's mm -hmm. 
let's return to the magic of the first movie mm-hmm. and try to recreate that. I could see I could see other thing happening. The second one is really about systems. We need you, you need us kind of thing. We're oh, in right. it together. The Oracle's like, you know, I'm right. only interested in one thing, getting to the future. Right. You know, we're only going to get there together. It's systems. I like the overall story mm-hmm. that I think I'm, I deciphered once. I, but tell me this, Bob, now that we're just on this topic, <laughs> as a Matrix expert, mm-hmm. when Neo was in the real world mm-hmm. and he is being chased by the octopus creatures. Yeah, right. And he manages to hold out his hand and right. blast those o- octopus creatures. Right. Which it looked like either it was a different version of the Matrix and they're mm-hmm. not really out of the Matrix or he somehow had supernatural powers that right. extended, you know, normal science or something. Right. How could he have done that? I, I have a problem with that. I yeah. think they're in the real world and this is like they decided they were going to use magic. Just bad writing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that seems entirely unrealistic. Yeah, okay. I'm glad you see oh. it that way because, yeah. you know, it ends, I think, too, with that. And mm-hmm. we expected in three to learn, wait, so how how did he do that? You know, and there's a physical scientific answer they could have done. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe they weren't really out of the matrix mm-hmm. or maybe, who knows, the yeah. the centri- centuries, or I think they were called. Maybe they just oh that's Neo we have to we have to self destruct because mm-hmm. he he's the one or, you know oh I, interesting you yeah. know who knows something right. uh, other than completely unexplained they never got to that you know how no. how is he able to do that right um, yeah Steve yeah I had a problem with that too yeah and I was I always think if I'm Neo I might really enjoy living in the Matrix as like having my superpowers and all yeah but does he see everything like green screen <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Yeah. I, I always thought of it as he could focus on different aspects of the matrix. Mm. He could focus on the the surface code or the surface result of the code. He could also mm-hmm. focus on the code. The code itself, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But what three TV movie characters would you say best portray your personality? You, you sent me this question the other day and I'm like, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Can you think of anyone? Because I could probably come up with some for, for you. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, you're very compassionate and soothing. Oh. So if there's a compassionate, soothing character. Oh, you know what? Hmm. Father Mul- Mulcahy. Oh, <laughs> He was very nice. I liked yeah, him. Yeah, he was nice, but ugh. What's wrong First with him? First off, I don't like MASH anymore. Oh, how come? Because it's the Alan Alda comedy hour, and I'm just like, ugh, Yeah, but that over. character, I, you know, he always was nice. You know, he always yeah. had nice things to say. He was That's soothing true. and yeah. okay. kind. All right. All right. Um, yeah. uh, let's see, who else? Um, but, you know, I know you beyond the compassionate, kind Bob. Yeah. So, oh, well, so I've actually compared you to other people and you were upset about it. I remember I was like, you always remind me of so-and-so. And And I remember you being like, what? That doesn't make me feel good. (laughs) Oh, you mean like right now? (laughs) (laughs) No, it was someone, you know, I guess you're kind of Bill Murray-ish. Oh, uh, that's fun. In a way, uh, for sure. Hmm. Uh, but there's who was it that I just remember thinking? I mean, well, Alan Alda. I think that's who I've uh, compared you to before. Oh, uh, I'm and, sure I got upset about that. Yeah, it, or it was someone like that who, because in real life, you like at a party, for example, mm-hmm. you make a lot of jokes. Like, oh yeah, you're you're the loudest laugher <laughs> and the most frequent laugher, <laughs> and you're the you like to make fun of yourself. You like mm. to be uh, helpful at a party in that sure. way. You know, you like to be the social lubricant, if you will. Mm. Mm-hmm. And Alan Alda, you know, with his various characters, he's kind of that way. Mm, yeah. Anyway, um, for me, I, yeah. I had a hard time answering this question too because oh. it's it's such a weird 
it's it's deceptively hard. You know, you mm-hmm. think, well, of course, okay. Uh, like you said, Neo or, you know, I don't know, mm-hmm. some other awesome character that you like. On, but mm-hmm. when you think about it, it's like, well, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't think of myself as like uh, Tyrion from Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I, you know, so I thought, well, how could I answer this question to, ans- you know, to satisfy Heather from Vermont? And I thought, well, Game of Thrones characters, I thought, well, young Arya, hmm. um, you know, in that she is lost and powerless. So this is when the first few seasons of of Game of Thrones. You watched Game of Thrones, right? Oh, you never watched it. I, I couldn't I, get I, past the first three episodes. I tried three times, and <laughs> I couldn't get past the first three episodes, and then I... I remember, I, I was like, one of my friends has not watched Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. and, I, and I was like, is that Bob? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so young Arya, it, if for people that watch the show, um, she's scrappy and passionate and... Mm. But powerless and angry and impertinent, and I, I definitely feel that way sometimes. Mm. Also, the kid from Time Bandits, I don't know, I just love that movie. And mm. he also is sort of lost and afraid, but um, up for the adventure. Mm-hmm. And also Jonathan Price's character in Brazil, um, in that he's also lost <laughs> and trying to break free, but eventually crushed by the system, uh, which I feel for sure um, really yeah i feel oh. like um i feel like i'm a tiny tiny little amoeba swimming upstream but ultimately making no ground in the direction that i want to go in terms of like wanting mm-hmm. to help society I, mm. I i see a lot of bad things happening i think all of us do mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. environmental wise political wise yeah stigma wise mm-hmm. budgetary you know allocations wise yeah uh, uh and that's not even just in our communities or in mm-hmm. our country but like worldwide priorities yeah things are only getting worse and yeah. loneliness wise getting away from our uh, what most people understand to be our natural state hmm. like where we're around more people eating more, you know, fibrous foods, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, and I I'd only see sadness and suffering ahead of me hmm. uh, as it's happening right now. Um, you know, I don't see rates of child abuse going down 10 mm-hmm. years from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't see rates of domestic violence being significantly reduced. I don't see rates of addiction being mitigated in significant mm-hmm. ways. I don't see rates of suicide going down. You know, we tend to think of ourselves, oh, look at this new iPhone. We're doing so much better. And mm-hmm. and I just, I just, I'm like, uh, or even, even, you know, say this episode, by the way, might come out, out after the election. <laughs> but, oh, okay. Um, so let's say your candidate won or lost. Well, that will feel like, either progress or a step back. Mm-hmm. But to me, I feel like I'm Jonathan Price in Brazil, if you've seen the movie. He's just sort of crushed by paperwork and government and a uh, indifferent system that just doesn't really care about humans, really, and is mm-hmm. only focused on like process rather than like looking at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Everyone becomes like a mechanized part of a you know machine that is just forging ahead you know no one can stop it and it just crushes all hope and humanity and individualism and goodness in the world <laughs> and mm. I, I I feel like uh, I just feel that way frequently you know I mean I don't think about it very much I'm a generally happy person but mm-hmm. if I think about like a character in a movie, I, you know, I definitely feel that way. And, well, you know, uh, like I said, the pe- we'll tend to look, the things we focus on is just like, okay, we got to win the next presidential election. Okay, we got to, you know, I got to protest this, uh, this injustice or something. And those are good things, you know, those mm-hmm. are things to do. Mm-hmm. But to me, we are focused, we're not emphasizing the right things, <laughs> you know, anyway, it's, it's. I'm just mansplaining now. That's, but anyway. not how, that's not how I view you. Actually, yeah. as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, well, how do I view Kirk? Did you see that movie Real Genius with mm-hmm. uh, Val Kilmer? Of course. Yeah. And and the other actor who we never saw again. We never saw again. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Um, 
and the other actor who you see all the time but can't remember his name yeah <laughs> the dean of the whatever the program or whatever the guy their teacher or whatever right anyways there's a minor character in that who is like um he lives in the dorm but he lives like you go through a closet and you find this elevator and you take the elevator down right uh -huh. and you go down to his like sort of basement dungeon apartment where he lives uh -huh. right the secret nobody knows he's there and nobody sees him he like just appears like one day you just see him in the hallway or whatever and he doesn't say much right and then you don't know where he's going you don't know where he's going when he goes right but he just so but he like is kind of like above it all <laughs> Right. And I don't mean that you'd like see yourself as above it all, but let's see, there was something about that. Because what I see you doing that I think is easy to miss is that you add goodness into the world. And I get it. There's a big sea of, I don't know, suffering. I guess it's a way to put it. And um, we probably are, we're going the wrong direction as a big, as a big Google group, you know, big group. And Americans are leading the way. And you add just a little bit of goodness. And so we got an email um, last week from somebody who, um, I believe they said we could talk about this in the podcast, but I can't remember. So I'll just be in a very general way, who said that um, they were feeling suicidal. You know, they were in a really dark place and they found your podcast and they listened to you and Umberto and me and they were uplifted. And you do that. I mean, I don't do that. I mean, I show up here and I'm happy to be here and I, I make my contribution. But you do this every day, all the time. You add this goodness to the world. I don't know anybody that's doing anything more. I'm well, glad you're out there. Yeah, that was a, one of the most touching emails. Oh, lovely. I think any of us have ever written or yeah. read um, uh, uh, from listeners and yeah, it it was in the details too. It was, mm -hmm. you know, someone that was very suicidal and then mm -hmm. um was just lost in the world and then found the podcast and it was mm -hmm. this little oasis and felt uh, like it gave them hope. They felt seen and heard mm -hmm. and they, you know, named you specifically. They named you me and Umberto. Yeah. And uh, then they went into more detail about their path forward, mm -hmm. getting help, mm -hmm. opening up, mm -hmm. and they now feel like they're in a good place. And mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't one of those emails of just like, you know, I just want to tell you, I just really like the podcast. It was like, yeah. no, I don't, I don't think you understand how important this podcast yeah. is to right. me. Right. And yeah, it brings tears to here's my eyes. Your, yeah. Here's and, your impact. Yeah. So you want to know... Who's a movie guy? Schindler from Schindler's List. There's this lovely line at the end yeah. where um, Ben Kingsley says to Liam Neeson, um, there's a, a Jewish saying, he who saves one life saves the world entire. Yeah. That's you. I mean, let's not take it too far, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I recently, that move, so part of my ritual now with Stacy is, We'll watch, we're usually watching a show, some sort of, you know, TV show. Right now we're watching Devs on Hulu. Have you seen mm -hmm. this show? Mm -mm. It's interesting. Oh, I did. I saw uh, a few episodes of the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Nick Offerman, right? Yeah, Nick Offerman. Yeah. And others. And um, by the way, I love the show in one respect because there are multiple Asian actors on the show. Right on. Um, which uh, is always a n nice thing to see. And also uh, accurate because it's in San Francisco and it's at a tech company. And if you've ever walked around in San Francisco at a tech company, you're going to see a lot of Asians, a lot of Asian Americans. And so many of these movies won't even have, you know, oh. they'll be in L.A. or San Francisco and they'll just, there won't even be an Asian person central mm -hmm. to the character. And they'll be at a tech place that's like vassy of white people and like a mm -hmm. token Indian, you know, East Indian person. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, and it's a very interesting show, which I, I plan on actually um, doing an episode about at some point. But anyway, our, our ritual is after that, I after we watch one episode, I'll just go to HBO and just like see what's on. And because uh, it's kind of fun to just sort of 
watch a couple scenes from a random movie and uh Schindler list was on uh oh. not not till a couple weeks ago and mm-hmm. and it was toward the end and i i watched it all the way to the end and man that movie is i mean especially for the time was just it's so good and the mm-hmm. the ending is just it just made me cry yeah and that line you know mm-hmm. that when because he is um as a white nazi party mm-hmm. member mm-hmm. Uh, lamenting that he hadn't sold his car, Mm -hmm. he could have saved 12 more lives. Mm -hmm. He hadn't sold his watch, that could have saved two or three more lives. And and Ben Kingsley is like, no, no, you know, the man who saves one saves the world, you Mm -hmm. know, whatever you're saying. Um, I don't know. It, yeah. I, I like, when I think about my mission in life and to get mm-hmm. emails like that, um, mm-hmm. it helps me realize my purpose. And so so many things like this, I say, well, if I die tomorrow, uh, I know that I, I tried. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I tried to do my part. Mm-hmm. And um, it's emails like that that, you know, it's not often that your purpose in life is, uh, there's evidence that you're actually succeeding in some way. <laughs> yeah, there isn't. <laughs> you know? And it's emails like that where I was like, wow, you know. Yeah. Um, so next question. If you woke up tomorrow and magically things changed overnight, what changes to the human body for greater functioning would you make? This is a question by Heather from Vermont. She, you know, So what changes to the human body for greater functioning would you make, Bob? Well, I wouldn't have a pinched nerve on my neck. <laughs> yeah. That was the first thing I thought was um, – because I'm because I'm the same way because I've been uh-huh. through you so oh, I don't yeah. know how much you want to share about no chronic. it's fine we can talk about all of it yeah um, is that um, I've had chronic back pain uh, in the yeah. past for a few years and it, it mm-hmm. wasn't that bad but it, it was demoralizing mm. and um, you know you you go to the doctors you go to the physical therapist and they're just like well you know here's some things we can do but mm-hmm. it it's probable given statistics that you might just be suffering for the rest of your life with oh, this. Oh, that I heard that one too. My I, that was when I had low back pain many years ago, and I'm grateful that that um, ran its course and hasn't really returned much. I yeah. did all the PT stuff you're supposed to do. Yeah, this is a new one though. My my neck, but anyways, yeah, I'm with you about how demoralizing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I could change one thing about the body, it'd be like some way so that we could turn off pain because it gets so weird um you would because we tend to think well there's got to be you know some extreme solution like surgery or or you just like sever the nerve how about that you just you know or or whatever Mm -hmm. but even those things don't necessarily work you know work yeah um or fuse the back or you know there's always some thing that you think at least i would that would be like, well, you know, there's always some answer. And it's just like, nope, when mm-hmm. it comes to spine and nerves and pain, they're off, depending, yeah, often right. is just like, nope, there's no solution. All of our treatments have yeah. more bad things about them than good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you're just screwed. And so yeah, that would be one, one thing I would change about the body. It's just mm-hmm. like some, either a medication or... Mm-hmm. Or the body just gets used to it and it turns off the pain signal because it's mm-hmm. like, okay, enough of the pain signal. Yeah. We don't need it to be 24-7. It's not, mm-hmm. There's no helpful evolutionary benefit to feeling pain 24-7, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and uh, so, yeah. I mean, I don't know how much you want to share. with. The, oh, with, it's fine. What do you want to oh, tell? So, so with COVID, everything's telehealth. And I wear bifocals and was sitting in a low couch in front of my screen for you know many hours a day having sessions and with the bifocals i can only make out uh, anything on the screen if i look through the bottom half of the lens so that means i crane my neck Uh oh did the thing freeze no you're good are you there yep oh okay anyways um uh i can only see clearly if i look through the bottom half so i'm i'm craning my neck i'm sitting below my computer screen and i'm sort of looking up at it with a crane neck, but looking down through the bottom of my lenses, if you can picture that, sort of right. turning my head up so I can look down and yeah. see it's in front of me. And, um, and as that's a like result, eight hours a day kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, right, right, okay. right. Yeah. And so um, I already have poor posture, kind of have a 
turning into a question mark a little bit because I have a kind of a lean over at the top of me. I, th oh. I swear I'm getting shorter. And uh, as a result, uh, it inflamed a nerve that goes down from my neck into my um, left arm. And so it was agonizing. And um, uh, we actually came back from vacation a week early and, you know, I started doing the PT stuff and um, getting, you know, the treatments that we have. So anti-inflammatories and um, gabapentin for nerve pain. And, and it's a lot better now. I still feel it, you know, and I'm still doing my exercise. And they say four to six weeks and it'll probably be okay. My PT's like, don't worry, it'll probably be okay. Lots of people have good treatment. They don't have to do or have good response, and they don't have to do extreme things to, you know, surgery and so forth. But um, uh, for yeah, a while, so, it was oh. depressing. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. And we came back early, and you know, Colleen and me missed out on a. I wasn't really much fun the week we were away, and then you know we came back early, and it's kind of the yeah. So yeah, no fun. Well, that's. I positive the prognosis yeah. about yeah, it, it is. for, yeah. for you yeah. Um, yeah, it is. yeah cuz my back is broken from football <laughs> and, oh oh right and so uh mm. it's there's a defect in the in the in my lower spine from is it like a disky thing or a nervy yeah, thing yeah essentially um one uh what do you call it spine what do you call it disc vertebra, vertebra. <laughs> Yeah. is um, pushed really f pretty far forward oh, and, and sort of like, you know, it looks like it wants to pop out like through my belly button, if no you will. No kidding. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know you had that. Yeah. And so there's uh, are very close or if not bone on bone, you know, touching as it sort of pushes its way out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of nerves that sort of come out oh, from that. <laughs> many. Down, down your legs, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a problem since I was uh, a teenager. Um, really? When I, when I broke it, yeah. Um, but mm. it's been different over time, you know, like um, it's, it's uh, sometimes it, it's worse than other times. But, mm. and there are solutions, like I'm supposed to have core muscles to uh, strengthen the whole right. system so that it stops the uh, movement, you know. Mm-hmm. Which reminds me, I should probably be better about my core exercises. <laughs> As I describe that out loud, I'm just like, oh my God, oh, like right. there's a lot at stake here, dude. Like you, because uh, sometimes I don't do my core exercises. And, and so, um, so yeah. Well, I, I'm glad to hear because when we actually, Bob hasn't been on the podcast for a while, mm -hmm. partially because of how much pain he was in. Yeah. Or at least entirely because of how much pain he was in. Pretty and much, yeah. um, so I am. Uh, so that's how bad it was yeah. <laughs> and um, so I'm glad to hear that it's better and I'm glad Thanks. to hear that the prognosis is good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I've had that before too like um, <laughs> I uh, the two times where I've had s not that bad as you're talking about but like mm -hmm. that shooting pain down your arms kind of feeling mm -hmm. was when I there were uh, I, a video game comes out that I'm really into right and I'm and I'm like hunched over on a <laughs> on a mouse on my computer for uh -huh. like for like twelve hours in a day, oh. right? It's just like there so when when Baldur's Gate two came out in like early two thousands, I played it at just nonstop. Mm. It's a it's a Dungeons and Dragons game on the computer and, and uh, I remember my back hurting for a while after that. And then I don't know, maybe about eight maybe five or six years ago. I can't remember what game it was, but it was some game that was maybe Civilization Five came out or something, and I was really into it. And um, and then I I realized that like you have to stretch, like you you know you can't just lock yourself in one position. Your mm -hmm. your body isn't designed to do that. Mm -mm. Um, but anyway, any yeah. other changes you would make to the human body? This question I found confusing. Like I wasn't sure how to answer it. Um, maybe better teeth. <laughs> So that's the other thing. I, we're, we're right on the same page. Uh -huh. Why better teeth? Well, you know, once you lose enamel, you're, they, they can't make more of it, right? You kind of yeah. got what you got. And um, me, I have, I was born congenitally missing six teeth. So I had wow. my last baby tooth extracted when I was 25, right? They had to yank that sucker out of my head. And then there were some gaps in my lower jaw on both sides and in my 
upper upper jaw are the is that what they call the upper jaw my top teeth yeah um did you know that the my front two are real but the four on either side are fake really right? yeah yeah so wow. and now i drink coffee so now the fake ones they don't discolor but the front ones unfortunately do so you can start to see a color change and right i'm supposed to get bleach for it and i keep putting it off but anyways it's not noticeable oh well yeah you're you're not yeah anyways um uh I so between that and Welbutrin, which I've been taking for what seven, eight years, something like that. I I have dry mouth, right, and then food does weird things, and so I am vulnerable to horrid breath if I don't if I'm not careful. So I floss regularly, like every day. I floss, right? I hate flossing, but I'll do it every day because because otherwise, come the end of the day, I come up to Colleen and she's like, mm, it's kind of sour. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the best things, it was so embarrassing, but one of the most important things that happened to me when I was, we were just out of grad school, maybe a couple, three years out of grad school, and I was working at the clinic. And I have a good friend, and I was over at his house. This is my friend David, the psychiatrist. I was over at his house. Um, I remember him. And, yeah, lovely guy. Yeah. He's down in San Diego now. Oh. Um, anyways, he, I something came up, and I said something to him about, you know, I don't know what, you got something on your face or whatever. And he's like, oh, thanks for telling me. And I'm like, no, that's what friends do. Friends help each other out like that, right? So that Monday, he walks into my office. This is like a box with no windows, right? He sits down and he says, remember the other day when you told me blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, you very often have bad breath. And I'm telling you this because there's actually some things you can do about it. And um, I know this is embarrassing. Wow. And I said, through closed lips, I said, thank you. Yeah. Because <laughs> breath, you can't smell. You can't smell your own bad breath. But I swear, I must have smoked out every client I had because it really was a tiny room with no windows. Yeah. So no circulation of air or whatever. And me, <sighs> yeah, on everybody. Well, so, I'll tell you, I've known you a long time. I can't remember you ever having bad breath. Well, that's good. So... And and you and I can talk very closely sometimes. That's so true. I uh, I can't ever remember you having oh, bad breath. Right on, good. And Anyways. I'm pretty sensitive to bad bad breath oh, too. Good to know. Yeah. Good to know. But I'm a good flosser brusher because uh, otherwise I'm going to smoke out my wife. Yeah. But I changed that because I don't I don't love that about the way my body works. Yeah. I, I think they're pretty minor things though, like. I can't think of anything like I, I was like, well, what like a different kind of organ or three more hands or yeah, I thought like, about that too, right? Yeah, like uh, what I want another, what I want all humans to have another arm, and I'm thinking, well, I don't know, was yeah. is that important? I thought, well, how about eyes in the back of your head? And I was like, hmm. well, what what could would that do really? Yeah, right. Uh, so yeah, my brain went eventually to. Uh, pain, some pain. some way of dealing with pain, as we talked right. about, and then the other was like try to solve the the tooth problem. I have a similar issue to you. I didn't know we shared we share a lot of physical things. Apparently, <laughs> we're similar height, similar weight, you know, mm -hmm. similar age and everything. But oh. um, and so uh, with I also don't have three. You have six that you don't. I don't have three. So really. Uh, so yeah, I had a baby tooth until just like I don't know five years ago. Wow. And, and then had an implant. Do you have an implant or do you have bridge? No, bridges. Yeah. So six, bridges are four. are more vulnerable because they can mm -hmm. degrade the teeth they're attached to. Yes. And I had a full on implant, which is right. like it. You know, they drill into my mm -hmm. jaw and they like just put it in there. Yeah. And so yeah, I have a. I have an implant here, but I also mm -hmm. didn't have two wisdom teeth, um, so uh, or two teeth. Un yeah, I didn't have two wisdom teeth, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when I had my wisdom teeth pulled, I only pulled two teeth, um, and so there are three that three baby teeth I, I or three right. permanent teeth I didn't have. If that right. makes any sense. Yeah, right. Um, but but similar to you, flossing. I actually floss. Every time I eat, I, fl I brush and floss, even if I have a snack. I've gotten to the point where I can't, I have so, anyone who's seen my, my mug notices my teeth are kind of janky. And I've never noticed your teeth well, as janky. No, well, they look fine. They're not straight. Let's just put yes, it that way. Yes, they are. What? I'm looking at you right now. They look fine. Well, there's a lot of gaps. You uh, got a couple I, of gaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And I like Stacy, my wife, when I look at her teeth, she had braces. I don't know mm. if this changed oh, it, but right. But her teeth look like there's no space in between right. each tooth. Right. For me, I have like probably 13 gaps in my mm -hmm. teeth that food regularly oh, right. gets stuck in. Right, there's a whole meal in there. Yeah, particularly if I eat certain, but I would say about half of the things that a human eats, mm -hmm. typically in America, yeah. will eventually work its way into between my teeth, and mm -hmm. I can feel it there. And it's mm -hmm. they aren't small gaps, you know, mm -hmm. they're pretty big, and mm -hmm. and it just drives me kind of crazy. And I also don't like the feeling of of teeth um, with with stuff on it. Anyway, oh, yeah. I wasn't like this when I was younger. You know, mm -hmm. when I was younger, I. I sometimes wouldn't brush my teeth at all, and mm -hmm. I and and I I went years without flossing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I probably didn't regularly floss until I was thirty years old, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, if for some reason, it just you know I'm just used to it or something. So, anyway, my point is is that I thought, okay, well, how would I change the teeth situation? And what I thought was one giant like tooth on the top and one giant tooth on the bottom <laughs> that that cannot be degraded in any way right right like no, no, tooth. no cavities no mm -hmm. anything like you don't need you, you know your breath mints fine but you don't need to floss because there's no gaps mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh there's not baby teeth and all it's just one mm -hmm. tooth just grows into your face when you're one year old and it just <laughs> never it just never goes away um the other thing i thought if i could change the body was no need for glasses you know, oh right! You were right. talking about earlier about you know basically your back your back problem is because yeah. of glasses. Glasses, yeah. And because of our weird need for so many. I mean, I I've often asked this question to experts: How would I have survived in on the Serengeti given how terrible my vision is and how common it is to have terrible vision mm -hmm. when without glasses without contacts. I, I, there's, I can't see the big E on, mm -hmm. on the, on the, me, you know, when you go to the optometrist, right. there's that big right. E on top. I can't see the big E. I don't even know where the big E is. That's how, but you put contacts in 2020 vision. Right. And so many of us are like this. And I'm just yeah. thinking, and I was like this when I was like 20 years old. Like mm -hmm. I, my, my, uh, uh, vision started to go when I was in the fifth grade and, you know, just got pretty quickly worse by the time I was 20 or 25. And mm -hmm. it just, it, it's such a weird, you know, for how important vision is to so many species, particularly us as, uh -huh. date, as daytime people. Right. It just seems like it would really, uh, those who were susceptible to this problem would have been weeded out. You know, mm -hmm. the saber tooth tiger would have had an easy time sneaking up on me, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, or warriors from a competing tribe would have easily killed me. I mean, I mm -hmm. would have just been standing. And go, you know, I would have known who was enemy, who was friend, mm -hmm. and, and I would have been picked off as would all the other people who need glasses a lot. And when I hear the experts, they say, well, uh, one, our modern society tends to exacerbate the problems because we live in a world where we look at very at a lot of things close to us and so our our eyes kind of adjust to oh, that right you know in the serengeti we would have been looking far frequently and short and far and you know mm -hmm. that's one thing and also genetics plays a role but it's like of course that doesn't sort of answer the question mm -mm. and then they say well you know it's possible that in the past um you would have had another role i don't know it doesn't make any sense to me because yeah. It would be like um, it would be like if forty five percent of humans by the time they were twenty five could no longer walk. Mm -hmm. it, it's that debilitating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you take out my contacts, I can't drive. I, I can barely walk through my house. Um, I can't see people's facial expressions. I mean, sure. that's an important part of like communication. I don't. Mm -hmm. I can't. I'd have to get really close to you to notice what mm -hmm. your face looked like. I You're wouldn't even know who at, you were. Yeah. You know. You're useless uh, at the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I'd be buying like you know light bulbs instead of food or something. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, so that would be the other thing I would change mm -hmm. is because. Wearing contacts and glasses is, and then of of course your 
uh, vision getting worse as you age is, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's really annoying. Uh, you know, Stacy, when she'll frequently pull out her phone and she's flipping through something and she'll be like, oh my God, this is really funny. And then she wants to share it with me and she always puts it too close to my face and I always have to push her arm away even though her vision is worse than mine, somehow she she thinks I can see up close or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so it it's it's just like this annoying, yeah. you know, teeth, pain. Now mm-hmm. we're just old people complaining uh-huh. about old people things, well, I suppose. I have to say, I, I have a small disagreement with you because I think, and I have always thought, glasses are sexy. Oh. But maybe we could wear glasses... And just have it be a fashion thing or something, you know? That, that works for me. Go ahead. Wear blank lenses. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you wear glasses. How bad is your vision? I thought your vision's pretty good. My vision's good. I started wearing glasses when I was 47 or 48. I'm 53 now. Um, because I of went reading? from No, no. They have a slight farsighted corrective correction. So they actually help me see distance, but I can get by without them. It's just more clear with them. Also, they correct astigmatism I have in my left eye. And then the other bit is for reading. So I always say to people, I went from no glasses to bifocals. Skipped right on over. Yeah. Yeah. But I definitely need the correction for reading because I would sit at night, I'd be reading my book, and I would just get teary-eyed trying to focus on, I couldn't even see the words anymore, right? Because you're farsighted? Because when you get old, you can't see up close. Right, right. So I couldn't read. But when you would look into the distance, you'd be okay? Yeah, fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. so what the optometrist said to me is, you're going to, you don't need them, but once you put them on, you're not going to want to take them off because they're going to help that much. Just right. enough that you're going to want them. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't like going around without them. Yeah. Which I never do anyways. But I would not get the ones that go shady when you go out in the sunlight. I have those now. Yeah. Annoying. Yeah. useless and annoying i would never do that again yeah i i did that too you i did I that had, too yeah I, I my glasses before it seems like a good idea it's like you it don't does. need you don't need sunglasses because right. when, you, when you're wearing glasses it's a pain in the butt to like well mm-hmm. what do you do you have to get mm-hmm. prescription sunglasses and carry mm-hmm. those around that's a pain mm-hmm. in the ass it is so they call them progressive or not progressive transition transition right and it's you know usually not cheap to add that Mm-mm. And it seems like a no-brainer, but mm-hmm. um, I'm curious, what, what, what did you not like about them? First off, they don't really shade that well. They're not as good as real sunglasses. Um, and second, when I'm out in the sun and I come in, it takes a while to be able to navigate because I can't, they don't switch that fast. Right. And I think they look dumb. Yeah. Those are yeah. the three things that I would have said. One, they don't really help in they the sun. Uh-uh. So two, when you come back inside, it's like you have to wait for uh-huh. a while to be able to see. And three, they look stupid. They look stupid. <laughs> they look dorky. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually have pre- prescription sunnies that have like a correction for my far and also readers. And I love them. Well, Bob, um, as I always uh, think I pre- I, pre- I prepared so many emails for us yeah. to answer, yeah. and we've gotten to one and a half <laughs> in all, almost an hour. And so let's take a break and reset. And when yeah. we get back, let's ser- let's seriously try to race through as many as possible because this list is getting longer and longer. What do you say, Bob? Right on. Yes. All right, we're back from the break. Okay, let's race through these. Heather from Vermont has one last question. Mm -hmm. Uh, She says, I so appreciate you and Bob's self-disclosure. I feel like these disclosures and real human experiences would have been beneficial when I was being, uh, when I was in graduate school to become a therapist. Hmm. What are people in, why are people in our profession not self-disclosing more? Especially Hmm. when it comes to creating real, authentic expectations and experiences from clients. Bob, what do you think? Well, um, therapy comes out of Freud. You know, it's got its deep roots there. And uh, Freud's original theory, and I think it probably got amplified, was that the job of the therapist is to be as blank a screen as possible so that the client's projections were free to come forth. And then the two of them could kind of see that. Right. But the more I insert my own personhood into our relationship, our interaction, the more I muddy the water for 
um, the ability to make out what's projection, right? So this is how I learn about what's my, my patient or my client's transference. So I can help them. And I think it's been kind of mm, mm, misunderstood as to be this sort of cold, you know, unfeeling, I'm just going to be a blank screen. Freud himself was not a particularly blank screen. And right. after, after a, a really juicy interpretation, he would light up a celebratory cigar in session with client. I yeah. don't know if he offered them to the client. Let's have a, but he loved a good interpretation and you know, who doesn't insights fun. Um, so anyways, but I think um, that may have been taken a bit too far and only since what humanism so that's like rogers and who's before rogers that that we've sort of thought of wait a minute therapy's in a re in a relational and this is the beginnings of attachment showing up in therapy and an understanding that way um but let's be clear that self-disclosure doesn't mean i just talk about myself let it all hang out or you know the other day i was watching this and I, this is what i think about the political blah 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 my self-disclosures um as a therapist. Are, yeah, as a therapist, are in service of my client. Now, that's different from being on the podcast. My self-disclosures here, I mean to be personal. Um, not that I don't share personally with my clients, but I'm, mi I'm mindful about, is this for me or for my client, right? So the other day I was sitting with somebody and I'm like thinking about, oh, I could say this. And I'm like, yeah, but is that for me or for the client? Well, I think that's for me. Okay, put that aside and stay with the person, right? right? A really wise thing to do because they actually had a lot more to say. And they don't need to hear from me so much as they need to say what's on their mind in this moment. And it's not like I don't want to listen. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. But on the podcast, I mean to be personal because I wish to destigmatize as much as I can um, fears about mental health and uh, mental health, dif mental health dif difficulties, which I guess you call mental illness. But I don't really. That's kind of loaded. So I don't like thinking about that um, to promote welfare. Yeah. It also that's, just feels good to get things off your chest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, that's my quick yeah. and dirty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the only thing I'll add to that is that mm -hmm. therapists and professors, take it from me, are some of the most insecure people on the planet, <laughs> um, you know, for various reasons. And mm -hmm. maybe everyone is terribly insecure. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that people will do when they're insecure um, as a professor or a supervisor or a classmate Mm -hmm. is to try to gain safety through what culture will tell us is safe, which is to be robotic and not emotional and quote unquote mm -hmm. strong and mm -hmm. um, not vulnerable and not mm -hmm. real. And mm -hmm. you're always cool. You know, uh, you're always in control. Uh, that nothing ever rattles you. And it's just like this ridiculous notion. Mm -hmm. um, we're human beings, we're, we're animals, and we have emotions, and mm -hmm. that we're, we are regularly rattled. <laughs> and so, particularly when you're a, a professor, honestly, I mean, um, mm -hmm. I have never been as scared. I mean, some of the most scary, legitimately, like, distressing, terrifying moments I've ever had as a human being have been as a professor mm -hmm. and as a therapist. Mm -hmm. I have had, uh, when I think back over like top 10 most scary moments of my life, I, five of them are as a therapist and as mm -hmm. a professor. Mm -hmm. And that's not, and I'm not just exaggerating. Like, oh my no. God, it was so, like, I, my body was literally yeah. like coming unglued in those yeah. moments. Um, there's so much at stake, you know, uh, because we're uh, culturally, and it's a cultural problem in our field, we privilege those people who seem in control and seem mm -hmm. to know everything. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it's just ridiculous. And, and it's a lot of pressure, obviously. And we also just generally uh, put pressure on professors to know everything, which is silly. I mean, the, the way to look at any teacher is they, one, spent some time learning about this topic, and two, mm -hmm. spent some time learning how to teach this topic. That's the only thing that differentiates teacher from student. Mm -hmm. uh, the student could know 10 times more about this topic than the teacher does. Who knows? But, uh, or the, the student could be better at therapy than the professor. You know, there's no way to, you know, you don't have to be professors, and I know from experience for myself and my colleagues, is like we, ha we, we like to think of ourselves as like we know everything mm -hmm. <laughs> and we know the answer to every question we are the I, platonic ideal of a professor and so um and therapist too by the way and so uh mm. when you're insecure you're going to clam up and 
um, I find that the most secu- as professors and therapists gain more security, Bob and I included, mm. the more self-disclosing we will do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I remember early in my career seeing people that I respected self-disclose professors. You know, there'd mm-hmm. be that one professor, that one supervisor that would just be like, I have no idea what I'm doing half the time, honestly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, whoa, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. How come I can't even admit that even though I'm starting out? You know, I'd be like, I can't admit that I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to say that to anyone. And I remember thinking, well, maybe one day I'll be so confident that I could actually say I don't know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? It's just like this ironic twist <laughs> when the times when you know the least and feel the most insecure are the times that you act like you aren't. And a lot of professors are are starting out in their in their career. You know, being a professor doesn't mean that you're super experienced. You know, you started fresh out of school. <laughs> yeah, I was Ooh, a professor. Six months out? Uh, uh, one month. Less one than a, month out. Yeah. I was, I was teaching, I was assistant teacher and teaching sections of a course, family of origin mm-hmm. course, literally weeks, you know, just a few weeks after, or one week after we graduate. Anyway, the, the right point is, is that a lot of professors have no idea what they're doing, and so they will be insecure. The other thing is lack of modeling. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing is an emphasis on professionalism that um, is, is uh, quote-unquote professionalism mm. and not coming across, you know. Like, there will be people that will hear you and me talk, Bob, as mm-hmm. professors, supervisors, therapists, mm-hmm. and they'll say, there's something wrong about that, mm-hmm. that they talk about their lives. There's something mm-hmm. unethical, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, nope, there are, you know, it can be, and there are certain things that we want to consider for sure. Mm-hmm. It's not like there aren't ethics but it just feels like, well, but you're supposed to be professional, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it's this um, culture, you know, professionalism is a very cultural notion. I don't know if you remember the book I wrote where I talked about professionalism. Uh, I did a, I, I, uh, you probably don't remember, but I went into, um, or was it the paper I wrote and not the book? Yeah, it was the paper I wrote. I probably Anyway, the point is, is I looked into professionalism. I mean, it gave it a lot of thought. Like, what right. is the definition of professionalism for us clinicians? What, right what, differ, what behaviors differentiate between professional behavior and unprofessional behavior? Mm-hmm. And it is almost impossible to define. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Uh, let's race through this. Right on. Uh, Robert, patron Robert says, I'm currently doing my internship with a supervisor that is average at best. Hmm. I did my first intake intake recently. I was nervous and I felt choppy during the intake. We do have an intake form, but it is pretty busy with a lot of information. I was wondering if you could explain what type of intake looks like for you. For example, do you go over informed consent first? then have them tell you about presenting problem, followed by the intake form. Bob, what do you do during your intake for your private practice? Uh, I usually start with the question, what ails? Like, yeah. What, what, got you, what got you here? And I, I stole that from Irv. That's how Irvin Yalom starts his sessions with his new client, what yeah. ails? Yeah. So, okay, if it's good for him, it's good for me, right? Um, and I listen. I pay attention to what the person has to say. Now, I don't work in an agency, so I don't have to think too much about, well, okay, how do I fit this into diagnostic criteria so that I can you know, justify to the powers that be that this person needs this therapy and what's our treatment plan? I don't have those kind of constraints. So mostly what I'm interested in is developing an alliance. My first session, my very specific explicit, well, explicit to me goal is to develop an alliance with this person and to learn about what it is that brings them in. Um, now, me, lately, it's couples. I don't really see many individuals anymore, and I, so I don't... Really? I don't take, yeah, yeah. So, um, I Just don't Just because to, those are the people coming to you, or those are the people you take, or...? That's what I'm interested in, is yeah. couple, couple work. So, yeah. I'd say probably 80% of my practice now is couples. Really? And, um, so... Uh, if I had well, to good choose. for you. I mean, by the way, because you, you know, didn't used to treat couples and didn't feel good at it and got trained and mm. did all the things, supervision and yeah. um, dedicated yourself to that. And now you're, you know, one of the best couples therapists in the region. That's great. I, as, I don't know if I'm the best, but it was the hardest thing I ever tried to learn is how to do 
Yeah. Good, good couple counseling. It is not easy. No. Uh, but it is really fun. Yeah. Like I woke up this morning and I've got, I had two couples. One I've been seeing for quite a while now and I love them. They're lovely people. And the other one who are relatively new to me, I'm fourth session and they are fiery. They fight, they get going. Yeah. And when they get going, I get going and I'm like interrupting and, you know, like hopefully not being a dick, but, or a jerk, but, um, uh, but definitely shutting it down, definitely shutting down the criticisms or whatever and explain to them why and, you know, your anger, good, fine, welcome, but that behavior, no, doesn't work. So anyways, so I'm not bound by um, some kind of bureaucracy. And if you're working in an agency, and I used to, you are bound by bureaucracy and so you have to think that way. I used to, after a while it got to me, it's like, how do I just think strategically to gather the information that is necessary in order to satisfy the bureaucratic and um, administrative part of things without that interfering with my relationship. And I got really good at it. And I can't tell you all the details because it's, it's micro. 20, well, it's 20 years ago too. I don't remember. Yeah. But um, familiarity with the paperwork is like, okay, I need this, this, and this, and that's all I need. And I can fill out all these forms. Yeah. And now I can just pay attention to my right. client. Yeah. I did the same thing at an agency. It was like, yeah. once you get to know the paperwork really mm-hmm. well and you understand mm-hmm. the, tasks that Mm -hmm. they want you to do you can cut a lot of corners Mm -hmm. by just getting to the essence you know like this Mm -hmm. form the only sentence you really need to pay attention to is this sentence and then by Mm -hmm. signing it you're understanding instead of like read the whole thing right now (laughs) you know it's usually like actually this is just this this is what you're signing off on and right um or how to do a symptom checklist very quickly Mm -hmm. verbally you know what i mean Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, right yeah yeah. Are we answering this person's questions? How do you do an intake? Is um, that what it is? Well, I th- you answered it. You know, you oh, okay. you do your, because I, so the patron, Robert, he, he's at internship and mm-hmm. um, he, one, doesn't do intakes very often. He does first intake mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. trying, one, he, you know, there's just a lot of problems. In fact, in our area in Seattle, interns can't do intakes. Mm-hmm. Um uh, MHPs, which are inherently more ex, uh, experienced, not that much more, but at least a little bit. But there's always a first session that you mm-hmm. do with with clients. Um, so I'll I'll answer the question in this way: that mm-hmm. for a time I was like Bob. I when I started out my career at a at an agency, I was annoyed with all the paperwork, and that boy was there a lot. And this is back in the day before computers, and so mm-hmm. you actually had just a stack of of papers that were like copies of copies of copies of copies. And and then in private practice, I was like, screw that. I'm just going to sit down and say, hey, what brought you, brought you in today? But then I started to teach ethics, and I started to look at more malpractice claims, and I started to teach people and supervise people. And I had a, a happy medium between the two, which is – um, that what I do, the very first thing I do when people come in is I go over the disclosure statement. But the main thing is I'm asking about, con- I'm telling them about confidentiality. And so I have a very, very uh, detailed but down to earth way of describing um, what confidentiality is. I won't say it, but it's, 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 mm-hmm. I say it in a way that is understandable to people. I don't, I don't use the language that's typically used in disclosure forms. And then I also will ask people if they consent to treatment. Because some every once in a while you'll have someone come into your office, and they might not actually want therapy, and mm-hmm. so I just want to establish that up front. Because if they don't consent to treatment, or there's some kind of ambivalence there, we need to have a conversation about that up front. And the reason why I explain confidentiality up front before I ask them what's up is that you know if if they somehow you know they're supposed to read the disclosure statement prior to the session, but right. that's not. Uh, um, sufficient in a court of law, you know, because, you know, uh, it's our job to really make sure that Mm -hmm. they understand certain things. And if the first thing out of their mouth is, uh, so the other day, you know, I'm I'm here because of anger. I have an anger problem. And the other day I pushed my kid down the stairs and I want to stop that and I want to work on that. I'd be like, "Um, I have to call CPS like as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, wait, you know, I'm like, well, it was in the disclosure statement. I'm like, well, the client could be like, but I didn't, I, I didn't know that, you know, and I don't want to be in that situation that happens right. sometimes. And so, yeah. I, so I'm very upfront about that. Um, 
And then the other thing is I, if it's couple and family therapy, I'll very briefly discuss the confidentiality between members, mm-hmm. which I won't go into. And then I'll open it up for questions. People don't usually have questions. The second thing I do is a very quick um, explanation of uh, for insurance. I don't take insurance anymore, but when I did, I would explain that process pretty quickly. I'd, if it was a couple, for example, one of them has to be the client. Mm-hmm. And so we would have a conversation about that. I would explain the the potential pitfalls of, you know, either option. And I would say, you know, I need to diagnose one of you or Mm -hmm. if it's individual, I have to diagnose you. And I'd talk about the pros and cons of that. And then I have a very, very, usually people who come into therapy with you and me, Bob, it's a pretty simple clinical picture. You know, it's not complex, uh, obscure DSM diagnoses. You know, they're they're pretty common issues, major depressive disorder, uh, dysthymia, generalized anxiety, adjustment disorders, PTSD, you know, pretty simple things for you and me to assess pretty quickly. And so mm-hmm. um, I would do that real quick. And then I would um, then I would go into what Bob says, which is mm-hmm. like, hey, what ails you? You know, what? Wh- why are you here? But, mm-hmm. but I'm very um, I'm mindful of the relationship, which Bob was talking about, just making sure people feel heard and understood. But also, like, I'm trying to get at, like, what do they want out of therapy? What, what's their hopes and dreams for, for therapy? And um, as they're talking, I'm usually uh, taking notes. Uh, the first couple sessions, I'm taking a fair amount of notes. After that, I don't really need to. Uh, Patron Jane asks, I've been seeing my therapist for about seven years. I feel that she is a very good listener, but she doesn't challenge me much. I like her as a person, but I'm wondering, should therapy last that long, seven years? My boyfriend went to therapy, and it benefited him immensely, and it only lasted six months. It was much more structured and goal-focused. I'm kind of jealous of his his experience because I've been doing this for so long and I feel pretty much the same. Is this normal and should I see someone else? How do I end things after so many years of a therapeutic relationship? Bob, what do you think? Oh, um, I wonder if this person is talking to their therapist about their feelings and their misgivings and their jealousy of boyfriend. Not that, um, so that um, uh, that person therapist can um, address, you know, what whatever that is, or at the very least, um, have a conversation about what kind of fit are we, and are you know, is this helping in the way that you want it to be helping? Um, none of that has to be in the dark. None of it has to be cloaked. Therapists are used to this sort of thing. They don't generally react defensively. Um, I think it's essential uh, that. I mean, you're paying a lot of money, spending a lot of time, energy, effort, resource on um, being there, right? So it makes sense that you'd want to optimize its benefit. And if you've got this thing in your mind, like, oh, they're not helping me. And, oh, a good listener, but they don't challenge me. And you're disappointed and you don't talk about that. That actually is by itself a, an issue of therapy because it's sort of like, well, okay, it, what makes it hard for me to be candid and frank? Do I want to learn about that? might not be my direct treatment goal. And it might be something I say, well, yeah, I really want to learn about that. Maybe that's not my agenda, my priority right now. But yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing. You guys can talk about it. Well, okay, what is it that you want to have happen? Oh, is there a better way to do it? You know, do you, can we change this, the, what happens between us? Or, or do you need somebody else? Maybe you do. Yeah. Maybe you want apples and I only know how to give you oranges or something. Yeah, absolutely. Just to uh, sort of chime in on the Mm -hmm. little bit. So I would have, you know, all the things you said, I completely agree with. Yeah. Um, Ruts are common in therapy, especially in Mm long-term therapy. So Mm -hmm. um, as Bob said, just talk with your therapist about it. Just be Mm -hmm. like, um, I feel like I haven't done anything. Um, I have had those conversations with clients frequently. They'll be like, so what, what have we, what are we doing where have we come from and where are we going? Mm-hmm. And a good therapist should have a uh, interesting answer to that. They, uh, um, and I some, like that. <laughs> so, uh, some therapists will, because of their massive insecurity, will not be able to answer that question mm-hmm. very well, uh, partially because they were never trained. This, you know, There's no class on how to answer that question. There should mm-hmm. be. And mm-hmm. I, I frequently will try to intersperse this into my supervision with people of just like, okay, um, I'm a client and, I, and, you know, I ask you this question, what do you say? You know, be like, oh, I don't know. And so I will role play that and just give mm-hmm. them, give them options. And, but it's kind of a, 
a ridiculous thing that some ther- if that some therapists don't know how to answer. I mean, if you ask your physician, you know, mm-hmm. Bob, with your back pain, mm-hmm. and you'd be like, um, I feel like my pain has not gotten any better. Mm-hmm. Um, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. If your physician was just like, um, huh, well, I don't know what to say, or they gave like an answer that didn't make any sense to you, that would be very upsetting. Uh, Mm -hmm. Your physician should say, like, well, research shows this and that, and so we've tried these options. Um, Statistics show that uh, this should work over this period of time. We'll reassess. You know, there's there's a conversation. There's a they have a a template that they're following, Mm -hmm. and therapists should have that template. Now, Mm -hmm. there are you know cognitive behavioral templates that are pretty easy to verbalize mm-hmm. and there are humanistic or interpersonal templates that are harder to verbalize but they're not non-verbalizable mm-hmm. <laughs> you should be able to verbalize them but it does require a fairly advanced understanding of theory and research and humans and change that i didn't really have until 10 years 15 years into my career mm-hmm. you know if you would have asked me that question Although, I don't know, sometimes I give myself the, a little bit short end of the stick mm-hmm. on that one. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but I definitely feel much more confident in answering mm-hmm. those questions now. Yeah. Um, so the other thing here is, um, are you sure, it, you know, uh, the other thing here is that you're like, well, it's been seven years and I feel like it hasn't helped at all. You know, that's possible, but it's mm-hmm. not likely. Mm-hmm. It, there, there's, there's likely things that either – you're not focusing on or that you're not aware of or you're just having a bad week and you're you're just you feel demoralized in a lot of ways including therapy so that's the other thing Mm -hmm. um now the larger question is answered by well you know if talking with your therapist doesn't help if reevaluating this doesn't help if setting your expectations a little differently doesn't help then you can always try other therapists. Obviously, mm-hmm. you would talk with your therapist about this as well. But mm-hmm. you know, I've it, there it doesn't happen very often. But you know, it's occasionally times when a client is just like, you know what, I, I just feel like all the options we've tried, it just hasn't helped. And so, mm-hmm. and I'll be like, okay, well, here are your options. We can try other things. We could just persevere, or you could try another therapist, and or maybe you try me and this other therapist, or you know, let's explore that. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes that's. You know, that's the path you take because uh, every therapist is going to have their own little different way. And obviously, there's pretty big differences and approaches that therapists will have. And so mm-hmm. uh, to change therapists when you've exhausted all the other sort of easier options, because changing therapists is not easy, makes total sense. And mm-hmm. I find that people get uptight about it, both client and therapist, when they consider this. Now, worst case scenario, you switch to another therapist and you're like, oh my, or, and you try three of the therapists and Mm. all of them, you're like, no, no, no. My original therapist was definitely better than these three. Then, you know, hopefully you have some deal where, you know, you can go back, Mm -hmm. you you tell your therapist, I don't want to, you know, not have you as an option. And you go, okay, well, let's work out a deal. Mm -hmm. You know, this amount of time frame, I'll, I'll, I'll accept you back into my practice, this kind of thing. Um, why not? You know, but I, f- I feel like people don't do that enough. Do you, do you think that's true? Oh, yeah. I think that's de- definitely true. I think as a client, I haven't done that enough. Uh, or I haven't spoken up about some feeling I had in our relationship um, with me and, m- me and my, my therapist. Not my current one. I'm pretty candid with him, but before, previous. And there have been many. And it should be noted that I think your current therapist really elicits that safety and creates that kind of <laughs> style of therapy where honesty is um, mm-hmm. required in a way that your uh-huh. previous therapist might not have done. That's true. He will not let us not focus on what's happening between us. Uh, that's his um, his beliefs about helping have a lot to do with what's happening between us in this present moment, which I, he, I appreciate that. Does he call himself interpersonal or psychodynamic? Do you know? I don't know what he calls himself. I'd be curious uh, because yeah, I'll ask him because it's very. It's I could see him calling himself psychodynamic. I can mm-hmm. hear, hear, see himself calling himself interpersonal and mm-hmm. subjective. I could also hear him uh, see himself calling himself existential. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'd be curious or gestalt maybe. Um, I mean, definitely not CBT. I can't imagine that. Mm. <laughs> no, he didn't do CBT. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, final question before we close. Have you ever been in therapy for a long period of time and thought, I, don't, I feel like this isn't working? Have you ever mm-hmm. felt that way periodically? Yeah. 
were you wrong or right at the, in, the, in those moments? Wrong or right? I don't know if it's that simple. I was in therapy with somebody for 10 years, uh, not long after I moved to Seattle. And she, I found my, um, I believe that the work we did together was very helpful. And there was a little bit of a gap. Like I was sorry for a number of years and then I stopped and then I went, I, re, I, re, I resumed seeing her. And after a while at that second girl and I said to her, I don't know that I need to come here anymore. That this is helping me. And she's like, oh yeah, okay. Well, you know, she was very non-defensive about it. I guess is the main thing I want to communicate. Um, and then once I had a therapist that I, I got referred to by a couple counselor that Colleen and me were seeing. And um, she was like, yeah, this is, I think this is the right person for you. Because this, that, and the other. And I saw that person for, I don't know, maybe four or six months, something like that. But I didn't find it helpful in the well, least. So for the first therapist, mm -hmm. do you regret not jumping ship earlier? No, no, that's fine fine i mean i don't think i held on to that feeling for very long before i brought it up is what i'm saying oh so the first nine years was helping and yeah. there was that final period where you're like mm, yeah. maybe we're stagnating and where we've tapped all we can yeah. out of this therapy yes period. okay yeah that interesting and the second one i probably did wait too long to speak up and say you know what i'm not sure we're a good fit yeah 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 i once had a therapist first session though and this lady was amazing she didn't do therapy the way I think about it. And she I was referred to her by um, my couple therapy supervisor. And he said to me, quote, I don't know what she does. I can't do what she does. But whatever it is that she does, she does it really well. And I saw her and um, I would say that she's a psychic. not uh, She's not like a traditionally trained um, therapist. And the things that we did together were not anything I know how to do. I actually took what a do course you mean? Give, give us a, I, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> my mind is going crazy. Like, what did she give us one snippet of what she does? Okay. So do you know what muscle testing is? No. Oh, so I hold out my arm, right? Yeah. And she puts her hand on my arm and she pushes it. She pushes it against it, right? And yeah. she starts asking questions. Yeah, yeah. It, okay, and, I know all yeah. about that. Yeah. And then when my arm goes down, she's like, oh, okay, there, there, that's the one, right? And uh, like, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know what that is, right? And then there was another one time she was saying, so let's ask the universe. And not all the spirits in the universe are good spirits, so we're not going to ask them. We're just going to focus on the good ones. And, like, I've never said that to a client, but I had no problem sitting there with her because I found her enormously helpful. And this is what she used to say to me. She used to say, well, you road test it. See if life is different. If it's not different, okay, fine. If it's different, okay, fine. So there was this one thing, a very specific thing, a thing I really wanted, and I said, I really want this, and... Um, she said, okay, well, here's what I would do. And then she did it. And she said, okay, go road test. And I, cause I said to her, how do I know it worked? I don't feel any different. She's like, well, go road test it. I did. I road tested it over the next two weeks. And I came in and I said, yep, worked fine. Right. Oh, the, but the reason she came to mind is cause, um, the very first session I showed up, I was a little bit early. I'm sitting in the waiting room and our time for a meeting has come and gone. And it's 15 minutes later. And she walks out into the waiting room and she's surprised to see me. She doesn't know me. She's surprised to see me and I go in her office with her and I said to her, mm, I'm thinking about leaving because, you know, you're 15 minutes late and it makes me think that uh, maybe this isn't going to, this isn't going to work. Right. And she said to me, yeah, I totally understand. If you need to leave, it's totally cool. Uh, I don't think we talked about whether or not she would charge me for that. And I ended up staying and then I worked with her for many months and I love her and she was not. A therapist the way I understand that but she was helpful hmm. all right everyone um, I thought we'd get to so many more so the next time you and I talk Bob I don't have to do any prep because I've prepped several other emails ready to go <laughs> right on and everyone out there please take care of yourself because you, you deserve it